So now that we know what permutations are, they're bijective functions on a finite set to itself. We also want to figure out how to use a more efficient notation to represent permutations. After all, representing a function can be a challenge, particularly if we have to list the image of every single one of the elements of its domain. So cycle notation is going to be a way that we can express a permutation in as succinct a fashion as possible, and it also gives us cues as to the algebraic properties of the permutations that we're working with. So how does cycle notation work? Well, good news and bad news. The bad news first. Not every permutation is what we'll call a cycle. The good news, as we'll see in a few minutes, is that every permutation can be expressed in terms of cycles. So if we can figure out how cycles work, they will give us the key to understanding how all permutations work. So first of all, what is a cycle? A permutation is called a cycle if there is a set of elements inside of the, the set that we're permuting uh, in which the following thing happens. That the image of A1 is that it goes to position A2 under this permutation. The image of A2 is that it goes to position A3 under this permutation, and so on and so on. So this element is getting sent to that position, that element's getting sent to the A third position, A fourth, A fifth, and so on and so on. And what makes it a cycle, the imagery of a cycle, is that it comes back around to itself, right? And so what that means is that once we get to this last position, the a kth position, its image comes back around to the beginning, a1. So this is sort of the mental picture of what a cycle is doing. Right? It's taking each of these positions and moving it one forward. a1 goes to the a second position, a2 goes to the a third position, and so on, up to the last ak, which goes back to the a first position. So if we wanted to write that formally, we would say that the image of the ith uh, element is i, uh, the i plus first element, uh, with the exception of the last, the a kth element, um, and then it, its image is a sub 1. So we'll not only call this a cycle, we'll also call it a k cycle, or a cycle of length k, if you like, um, if we find it uh, helpful to say exactly how many uh, uh, elements there are here that we're permuting. So that's what a cycle is. Um, again, the bad news is that not every permutation is a cycle. But the good news is that every permutation can be expressed in terms of cycles. So let's take a look at how that works, first with a small example that we've seen before, uh, and then with uh, this example here, where I have seven letters that I'd like to figure out how to permute using cycles. So in this little visual, what I've done is I've put the four letters, P, O, S, and T, uh, as the, the set that I'd like to permute. And then what I've also done is I've given a depiction of every possible type of cycle that we could apply to this set of four elements. So for example, if I take the cycle 1, 4, what would that mean? That would mean that the first element is going to end up in position 4 after my permutation, and the fourth element is going to end up back around at position 1 in my permutation. So what's going to happen if I do that permutation to this set? If I apply the permutation 1, 4, notice the P ends up in the fourth position, the t ends up in the first position. So 1 and 4 have traded places. We would call that a cycle of length 2. Because you'll notice that the other two elements here, out of the four, they're not changing at all under this permutation. And any of the cycles of length 2 that I have on this row here that I could pick from, two elements are going to trade places, and the rest of the elements are going to stay put. So 3, 4, for example, turns post into pots. Uh, 1, 3, for example, would turn POST into SOPT, and so forth. Okay, so how about the three cycles? What do those end up looking like? Let me take one of them like 2, 3, 4. So what does that mean? That means that the second symbol is going to end up in the third position, the third symbol is going to end up in the fourth position, and the fourth symbol is going to end up wrapping around to the second position. If I apply that, what I get is PTOS, right? 2 goes to 3, 3 goes to 4, 4 goes back to 2. And here, 1 has stayed put. And then just for completeness, let's also try a 4 cycle. Maybe the 4 cycle 1, 4, 2, 3. Maybe this one right here. So the first symbol goes to position 4. The fourth goes to position 2. The second goes to position 3. And then the third wraps back around to position 1. I do that, and what I get happens to be the word stop. So the question in the previous video is, what permutation turns post into stop? And in cycle notation, we would say that the permutation that does that has the cycle notation 1, 4, 2, 3. It's a 4 cycle. Let's analyze another example. So here's a set of 7 elements, the letters in the word replays. 
How could I write that anagram that turns replays into parsley using cycle notation? This is going to be an element of S7, the symmetric group on seven symbols. So first, I'll number all of the elements in my set, 1 through 7, because that's traditionally in cycle notation. We use numbers to represent the positions. Then I just have to ask myself, and I'm going to start with position number 1, what's the image of position number 1 under this permutation? Where does the R go? We find out that R goes from the first position to the third. And so my cycle is going to begin 1, 3. But then where does 3 go? Where does the P end up? The P ends up back in position 1. And so the first thing I notice is that the R's and the P's are merely switching places. And so the cycle 1, 3, 1 goes to position 3, and then 3 goes back to position 1, is a part of this permutation. It's not the whole thing, but it explains what's happening to the R and the P, that two-element subset of my seven letters. So that means that I'm going to need a separate description for what happens to 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Let's take a look at those. Where does my symbol from position 2 end up? Where's my E? 2 goes to 6. Then where does 6 go in continuing my cycle? The Y. 6 goes to 7. Where does 7 go? 7 goes back to 4. Where does 4 go? 4 goes back to 5. Where does 5 go? 5 goes back to 2, and now I'm finally back home. So by tracing what happens to each of these elements as we go along, 2 goes to 6, and 6 goes to 7, and 7 goes to 4, and 4 goes to 5, and 5 goes back to 2 as soon as I've gotten back home. Now I know that I've completed my cycle, and I can finish. So I can express this permutation as a composition of two cycles. The 2 cycle 1, 3 that flip-flops my R and my P, and then the 5 cycle 2, 6, 7, 4, 5 that describes what's happening to the remaining five symbols. But then you might ask, if you're thinking abstract algebraically, does it matter if I write the 1, 3 before the 2, 6, 7, 4, 5? Or can I trade places? If I sort of flip-flop my green letters around first, and then I worry about flip-flopping my purple ones afterwards, do I get the same permutation at the end of the day? And I think that one of the nice things about color coding this diagram is that it exposes right away that the answer is it doesn't matter. If I do the purple permutation first and the green permutation second, or vice versa, those two are not playing on one another's turf at all. Each one of them is only impacting its own disjoint subset of the elements that I'm permuting. And therefore, these two elements commute with one another. Because neither one is affecting the other one's elements at all. And so it doesn't matter which one happens before the other. They're affecting disjoint subsets, and so we call them disjoint cycles. And that suggests the first of our theorems on this slide, that disjoint cycles commute with one another. That's actually excellent news, because anytime something commutes in abstract algebra, it's a cause for celebration. Because in general, we can't expect that things do commute. Um, but when they do commute, uh, we are sort of living in, in familiar worlds. Of course, cycles that are not disjoint have no guarantee of commuting, and in general, they don't. But cycles that are disjoint do. The second thing we notice is that the process that we just underwent to figure out how to express this permutation starting from stack notation, getting it into cycle notation, this procedure will always result in a product of disjoint cycles. Because as soon as I figure out, as soon as I finish one circuit, the way that I finished this 1 and 3 here, and I move on to the next one, I know the next one's not going to overlap with my first one, right? just based on the construction that we used here to come up with this. So that actually suggests a proof of a second theorem here. That, in fact, every permutation, any stack notation that I can write down for how to permute the elements of a set, I can always use this process to express it as a product of disjoint cycles. And that product that I get is going to be unique up to the ordering that I choose for those cycles. Because of the first theorem, the order doesn't matter, and so I can write this in either one of these two ways. But the cycles that I use to write the set of cycles that I use is going to be uniquely determined by this process. So every permutation can be expressed as a product of disjoint cycles, and that product is unique up to the ordering of those disjoint cycles, which doesn't matter. So we've gained a lot in this video, because now we know two things. First of all, how to use cycles to express permutations in a nice, compact fashion. But second of all, we got an understanding of why cycles are so important. Because every permutation in the world can be expressed as a product of disjoint cycles, and those disjoint cycles commute with one another.
There's more good news about cycles. We'll see it in the next video.